Children of the Corn 666, The Return of Isaac, was released in 1999, and this stars one hell of a hot, hot girl named Natalie Ramsey. Um, as soon as she shows up on screen, I am telling you, this girl is gorgeous. Words cannot describe. Hottest girl in the Children of the Corn series so far, by far. No lie. I'm telling you, the star of this film, she plays Hannah. Hannah is so sexy in this movie, not even funny. Now, outside of that, uh, Children of the Corn 666 um, seemed like, especially in this four-pack, the one that I was going to like the least. I don't know why, just the return of Isaac. Isaac was... Uh, definitely iconic for a character, absolutely. The same actor who plays him in this one as uh, as the actor did in the first one, same guy. But for some reason, I don't know, this one just, maybe it was the cover, uh, the name of it, it just seemed like it was going to be a really mediocre, low-budget, uh, like, cheaper version of the first film kind of thing, and just bringing back an icon for the sake of bringing back an icon. This film, I must say, really, really did impress me, um, especially atmosphere-wise. Atmosphere, this film is fantastic. Um, phenomenal atmosphere and um, cinematography, I would say. Directing, mm, it, it takes a little dip on the directing and the writing, especially with, like, logic issues. And this is only an hour and 20 minutes as well, which I find definitely didn't overstay its welcome. Like, any longer, it might have been a little bit too much. However, I don't think they were able to cover everything they wanted to cover in this film in an hour and 20 minutes. It definitely felt like they were kind of like, let's let's pick up speed and kind of get this over with kind of thing. I really felt that throughout the, the runtime and the way things were progressing. But man, is this film filled with amazing atmosphere. The beginning of the film especially, you get this, like... Um, like very yellowish, orangey, very fall um, duskness, like uh, like just after sunset when like the sun is already gone and there's just a little bit of light left, but everything is mostly dark and gonna like turn into nighttime. And you got the the cornfields which look great. Uh, the music is fantastic, and um, and there's just this great cinematography and atmosphere as the credits are basically opening up. Um, and then we are introduced to Hannah, of course, so sexy. She's driving down in this, like, beat-up car. She's going to Gatlin, which is the famous small town from the first movie, where she's looking for her mother because she has visions of her mother, and she, her mother basically gave her up, and, uh, she has visions of her mother. She's had him all her life. She's, uh, turning 19, and she basically is going to Gatlin to look for her mom, um, and that's how the film starts, so... She gets into a car accident, which <laughs> is generally the case in what happens in uh, these Children of the Corn films. This uh, sheriff comes along, and the sheriff starts to become a little sketchy, obviously. Takes her ID, uh, definitely recognizes her uh, right, at the, right from the start. As soon as she looks at her ID and her information, she knows exactly who this girl is. It's a very small town, and as we begin to find out really quickly, everybody is expecting Hannah. Uh, yes, Hannah. Um, everybody's already expecting her. There's a prophecy going on. Uh, the prophecy is supposed to come true, and all these events are supposed to take place in order, the way, like, the way the he who walks behind the rose or whatever the hell has predicted through this whole time. Uh, she goes to the doctor, and, like, the only doctor in town. It's a really small community kind of thing. And... This hospital is basically a doctor's office, but it's also like a mental ward. And we learn that Isaac is in a coma and has been for 19 years. Um, there's this guy named Jake. And um, Jake is basically this patient who just keeps on like referring Bible quotes. And you can tell this guy is like a whack job. He's, he's, he's always paranoid. He's paranoid about everything. He's like uh, talking about you know, the light and the, the, all kinds of biblical shit. Like, he's just that crazy guy, that, that sporadic, like, paranoid guy <laughs> that, uh, that's just always, like, sketched out all the time. And, uh, she also encounters this guy named, uh, Gabriel. 
And it's funny when Gabriel comes on screen because she, she goes to Isaac's room and Isaac is there in a coma technically, but his eyes are open and he's just kind of like laying there. He's almost like he's paralyzed or in some kind of catatonic state or something like that. And uh, this guy Gabriel shows up at the door and he's just like, hi. And it's one of those moments, or she's also like, hi, because he's like the hot guy and he's got like the longish hair and leather jacket. He, he's that badass dude. And she's just like, hi. And just, they form this like instant chemistry that comes out of nowhere and would not happen. <laughs> it's just like from complete stranger to like, I don't know, a crush, I guess, happens in like 0 0.5 seconds. So no time wasted on that one. And then they start kind of like exploring the hospital, hiding from this Jake character. She starts to get a little bit more information on like, what's going on in the town and everything. Um, everybody in the hospital kind of, again, seems to be into this um, prophet, like um, prophecy kind of thing, expecting Hannah and everything, even this Gabriel guy who she leaves the hospital and uh, another nurse is like, why didn't you make her stay? And uh, he's like, the prophecy says that she's supposed to return on her own, let things happen the way they're supposed to happen. She goes to a motel and the woman who works at the motel is really sketchy too. She's she's acting like a complete bitch all the time. And uh, there's this other guy who works there. I think his name is Matt. And uh, there's not a lot of characters in this film. Like you're introduced to like maybe six or seven. And it seems like it's just those six or seven that live in this entire town. And um, obviously the mother is introduced throughout the film too. Her name is Rachel. And uh, she reveals that of course she did... Um, not abandon Hannah, but send her off somewhere else so she could get away from this whole prophecy bullshit thing. Because um, there's, a, like, um, Isaac now has a son named Matt, the guy that works at the hotel. And um, <clears throat> they're all destined to basically sacrifice um, Hannah on, like, the eve of her 19th birthday when she comes back to this town uh, kind of thing. And like I said... Um, I think this film is more style over substance, in my opinion. And the style's great, um, but it, I don't know. The substance just and, and the whole prophecy stuff does get a little confusing as the film goes on. Isaac obviously does phenomenal, just like he did in the first one. He's aged, obviously. This is 15 years after the first movie. But he still has that creepy smile, and uh, there's a scene where he electrocutes a guy. He, he takes like a live wire and he throws it in the water and he's just given those those uh, those Isaac eyes. If for anybody who's seen the first film, he's just got that that half uh, quirky kind of smile, like the half smile. It's uh, it's so funny. Um, there's a character named what's his face uh, Jesse, and Jesse again. He he's not a big character. He's just um, he kind of shows up at the in the middle of the film and then there's a scene where he's about to have a fight with. Gabriel and he's really good at using a machete like Jesse is really good at using a machete apparently um, but he, he's he's ready to whip uh, Gabriel with the machete and then he lunges at uh, Gabriel and he's about to swing it and Gabriel literally just like grabs him by like the waist or something and just flips him over and then he drops the machete and then he basically uh, Gabriel basically picks up Jesse from the face and puts him against the wall and like crushes his nose like up into his brain or something like that but I'm like, Jesus Christ, like, first of all, anybody can use a machete on a guy who has no weapon. <laughs> and second of all, how do you go down that easy? It was just so, so bizarre. And there's, there's this other scene where um, Matt basically kills himself by using a sickle. <laughs> and he puts the sickle on the ground where the sickle's blade is sticking up. And then he's just standing, and you're kind of assuming that he's going to fall on this sickle. And then this uh, this metal song that sounds very 90s and like the grunge style kind of, kind of God smack, but kind of not, um, starts playing. And it's a really cool song, but you're just anticipating him. Like, you're like, is he going to fall on this sickle and like commit suicide that way? And of course he does. And uh, the sickle goes like right through him. And um, interestingly enough, he Who Walks Behind the Rose was never necessarily mentioned. I mean, it was in the third film uh, briefly, like on what it is kind of thing is what I mean. It was briefly in the third film how they um, they portray it as like this 
bug, uh, giant insect thing that lives in the corn um, in that back alley, like at the end of the third film where this giant ass bug starts to come alive and that's what's supposed to be he who walks behind the rose. <laughs> in this one, it's just Gabriel. It's just like, you're he who walks behind the rose and Gabriel's like, yeah, it's me. And it's just like, wow, is that the human form of it or... I don't know, it was, I found that kind of bizarre, but still interesting at the same time. I mean, at least we get, like, a face to put on, you know, he who walks behind the rose, but it is what it is. Um, and yeah, um, for for an Isaac's return, like I said, I, I, I just for some reason was expecting this film to be a lot more boring than it was, but uh, it really wasn't. Like, the story's there, and... Um, there's definitely a lot of meat to chew on, but I think where this film wins the most is just how atmospherical it is, um, even compared to, like, 4 and 5. 4 is still my least favorite up to now, like, out of these six films. 4 is The Gathering is definitely the one I just found the most kind of boring, um, the least happening, the least memorable for sure. And then 5 is the one I watched last is great. And then this one is pretty damn good, too. I mean, you can't go wrong with Natalie Ramsey in this role, though. Oh, my God. I was just drooling over this girl the entire film. So, eye candy galore on that one. Um, but, uh, but yeah. And I wouldn't say that her and, and Gabriel have much chemistry. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And um, maybe some of you will be watching it for Gabriel, too. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Damn. Damn, damn. Um, yeah, style over substance. That's basically what I would give, um, what I would leave this this film as. And uh, kills are okay. Kills are pretty good. You know, there, there's definitely been uh, less eventful ones. Like you, like I said, there, the, um, the electrocution kill is great. Um, Jesse's kill is great. And then Matt's uh, sickle suicide is, uh, is pretty great too. And there's also another one with the sheriff because, uh, again, these films always have to play a little bit of a supernatural part along with the grounded part of the story. And um, there's a scene where Gabriel's walking past the sheriff and the sheriff is ready to shoot Gabriel and he's just like, he, he starts to use these telekinetic powers to have her put the gun to her head. And then he's just like, boom, and then she shoots herself. So um, those moments are pretty interesting too when they bring slight supernatural uh elements to the whole story going on but um this this film isn't like super detailed there's not like there's not a lot to unpack um the story like i said is pretty simple in the way i just put it where hannah's coming to look for her mother she finds her she discovers this town then she discovers this prophecy that she has always been destined to be a part of and then um shit gets figured out and <laughs> she uh she you know defeats the evil and then her and her mother live happily ever after that's basically how it goes and you have uh isaac with his epic return uh waking up at the precise moment after 19 years on that night where he's supposed to and then doing his whole sacrificial stuff and uh quotes and all that stuff it's it's a it's a children of the corn direct to video sequel it's uh it, it's exactly what you expected it to be and it's on the plus side rather than the shittier side so it's not a bad watch it's definitely not a waste of time in my opinion and it's one of the better ones in this four pack that i got so uh yeah going on to seven next uh whenever i decide to sit down and watch that one we will see how it goes i everybody says that as you go on this the sequels get shittier and shittier, but uh, we will see when we get there, won't we? Subscribe to Morgan Film Fan if you like to listen to my voice or if you like my film reviews, and uh, I will be back soon, so stay tuned if you are interested. Until next review, have a good one, take care, have a good night, and cheers.